Hello, my wonderful besties. I hope you're all well. We're back in our shoujo analysis era. Ah! And if any of you, if any of you are thinking about leaving a comment saying, K, Momo and Kyrie are made for each other. K, at least Sai was good to Momo in the end. I'm here to tell you right now. We don't care. Today, we're going to be talking about Peach Girl, which if you've been around Basic Boy headquarters for a while, then you would know that this series is the bane of my existence, yet still manages to be my number one guilty pleasure series. My relationship with Peach Girl is complicated because... No, I don't condone what I personally perceive to be the subtle messaging of putting yourself second place in a relationship. Kyrie agrees to be Momo's boyfriend while he has feelings for another woman. And the mess that was Sai and Rio's relationship. At the end of the day, most of them are teenagers and are not fully to blame for making dumb choices, but I wasn't a huge fan of those storylines, so the series can be quite frustrating from an analysis standpoint. However, I would be absolutely lying if I didn't say that I didn't like Peach Girl because you, you might, might be, be surprised, surprised but, but I, I actually did, did quite like, like this anime. anime. It was very entertaining. <laughs> if you thought the anime adaptation was the final installment of the Peach Girl franchise, hold your jaw before it hits the floor. There are two more stories left in the series. Both were written by Miwa Ueda. So what better excuse for me to binge these mangas in the time span of a week than to provide you all with word vomit on the mess that is Peach Girl. For those of you who haven't read or watched Peach Girl, it is a shoujo slice of life romance series that follows 16-year-old Momo Adachi throughout her high school life. As a swim team member, she's been constantly battling acceptance from her peers because of her tan skin and bleached hair caused by the chlorinated water. We meet her frenemy, Sai Kashiwagi, and her two love interests, Tojikomori Kazuya and Kairi Okayasu. The story follows these four through their high school antics and discovering who they truly love. Obviously, there is more to the plot, Go back through the channel. Peach Girl, for most people, is simply viewed as a guilty pleasure. A story where romance and drama are at the center of the plot. We all can relate to having fake friends, someone we had a crush on, being bullied, and also stuck in a love triangle for an entire decade. Oh, wait, but... We haven't gotten there yet. Just for context, the first Peach Girl manga ran from 1997 to 2003. The anime adaptation ran from January to June of 2005. Sai's story was published in 2006, and Peach Girl Next was serialized in leading shoujo magazine Be Love in August 2016 and published through Kodansha in Japan in 2017. Peach Girl has sold 13 million copies with the live-action J-drama movie premiering in 2017. Miwa Ueda also won the Kodansha Manga Award in 1999 for Peach Girl as well. If you want to learn more about shoujo manga from an industry standpoint, I highly recommend watching Colleen's video on the diversity of shoujo manga. So, so good. <laughs> I'm not going to be going too deep into this because I just don't feel like I'm the right person to talk about it. But when you consider the climate surrounding the shoujo demographic compared to others, you can tell that the numbers of titles being released is significantly less. When Sai's story was released, there were only 14 other titles being serialized in Bisatsu magazine from 2010 through 2019. Correction, from 2000 to 2009. Also, I'm mainly looking at English translations, by the way. I know there are more titles that are sold in Japan, but that's a different conversation for another day. <laughs> so it's not surprising to see that Be Love and Bisatsu magazine has serialized some extremely popular series such as Mars, The Wallflower, Chihaya Furu, and Kiss Him Not Me. This leads to several shoujo slash slice of life series such as Oren High School Host Club, Bokudaka 
Lupita and Nana making a resurgence. And I think the app to blame for this is TikTok. This app was just a seed in my brain and my thoughts just grew from there. Someone stop him, he's thinking. So I want to talk about why. Firstly, let's discuss the pandemic. In March of 2020, a majority of companies and institutions went into lockdown to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Streaming services were performing quite well during the height of the pandemic because everyone was back at home. People were either working or studying from home or not working at all. So everyone's world started to become a lot smaller and you would binge popular series in your downtime. For most of us during quarantine, we found a lot of anime and manga series to binge because that was the only way we could, you know, stay safe in these times. Some very interesting shoujo slash slice of life series started to resurface during the pandemic, such as Vampire Night where high schoolers Yuki and Zero attend the prestigious Cross Academy in which their goal is to keep a balance between humans and vampires who attend the school. The face of the night class, Kaname Kuran, has feelings for Yuki and ensures her safety and happiness. And the love triangle between her, Zero, and Kaname commences. Made Sama, a slice of life series that follows student council president Misaki, who seems like she has her whole life together. Until until popular boy Tatsumi spots her working as a maid in a cafe and becomes a regular customer to get to know her better. They become a dynamic duo and both fall for each other nearing the end of the series. Needless to say, several shoujo titles are becoming more popular than they ever were in their release. The amount of Peach Girl TikToks I see is crazy. I'm sure we all can come to the consensus that we like Peach girl because it's bad. We like it because it's messy and chaos equals entertainment. Attention all anime TikTokers. I need a new anime to watch that's exactly like Peach Girl. Peach Girl is the amount of chaos I never knew I needed. Back in the day I used to skip this on the Funimation channel, then I finally gave it a watch. And now I need another anime exactly like it. If you want to read the world's most dramatic manga, read Peach Girl. I initially read this when I was like seven because I saw it at my local library and I picked it up because I was like, oh my god, the main girl is tan, like, you know, interesting. I should not have been able to check out this book at seven years old. It has the nastiest love triangle and like frenemies relationship. I don't even think Sai is like a friend, she's just an enemy, but for some reason Momo was like friends with her. And the thing is, after the main series ends, she gets her own, like, spin-off sequel where she, like, kind of improves as a person, but not really. And then in Peach Girl Next, which happens, like, 10 years after Peach Girl finishes, she comes back again and it's, like, the same drama happening again when they're 27. It's... And there's 18 volumes of about this and it's so messed up, but very entertaining, so... Give it a read. However, whilst researching for my video, I found that Miwa Ueda wrote Peach Girl from a place of experience. There is a really great encyclopedia article that talks about Ueda's inspirations and main themes for Peach Girl. A lot of this information is coming from this article. Ueda said in an interview that of all the characters in the comics I've ever written, Momo is the one who's closest in real life to the way when I was young. Which is why at the beginning of the series, the colorism storyline was so accurate. It definitely felt real and audiences could understand where Momo's insecurity stemmed from. Her tanned appearance didn't allow her to make friends and she was always perceived as the party girl. In the same encyclopedia article, Ueda also mentions that, I also had a complex about people being scared or intimidated when they saw me. This stereotype of a tan skin person being intimidating reflects the broader issue of darker complexion people being othered by their lighter skin counterparts. 
Hearts, which was one of my main gripes with the series, especially the anime. It just felt very surface level in its depiction of colorism, because once Momo gets into a romantic relationship, that storyline just suddenly vanishes. Miscommunication is now the primary reason why Momo struggles in her life. There are definitely points where colorism is still acknowledged, but the writers dialed that back a lot compared to the start. I do think Peach Girl getting some mainstream attention on TikTok has allowed people to get more exposed to the series and why many of us who watched or read the series revisit it now today. Sorry, oh, basic boy's gonna need a break. Sai's story takes place 18 months after the events of Peach Girl. After failing to attend school during the Rio incident, Sai now has to repeat her senior year of high school. Momo and Kairi are college psychology majors, and Sai still wants to be a part of their antics. Sai's old friend slash crush slash monkey boy, Kanji, enters the picture where he wants to rekindle his and Sai's relationship. Sai doesn't fully remember him since he moved to Malaysia when they were kids. She tries to avoid Kanji any time she gets as it reminds her of her tragic past. Kanji desperately wants Sai to see him as a potential boyfriend, but Sai does not acknowledge his existence, often pushing him away, which ends up getting her into multiple relationships with Takuma and Shinji who only want her to feed their male egos. She pretends to be a college student with Momo and Kairi in order for her not to feel left out. The story gives us a deeper insight to Sai's actions and why she is the way she is. Sai is a bit of a wild child in this story. She often acts out whenever she's around Momo and Kairi. She is jealous that they are in a lovey-dovey relationship and she wants to have this experience for herself. This is classic Sai behavior and there's nothing wrong with being jealous. If I saw someone in a very lovey-dovey happy relationship when I wanted to be in a relationship, I'm obviously gonna be envious of them. That's just human nature. But jealousy is a common trend in Sai's character. She's not able to escape it no matter if she becomes happy. This is where Kanji enters the picture. He is very sweet, kind-hearted, likable, and let me tell you, I was shocked that he and Sai didn't get together, but I'm gonna elaborate more on that later. Sai constantly dismisses Kanji's existence even when he has her best intentions at heart. And it's not like Kanji's ugly. I mean, his character design is pretty dashing. But anyways... Kanji saves Sai when she is drunk at a college party when some men were going to SA her. And what does Sai do? She acts ungrateful, of course. She fails to see the common denominator of her problems, which is herself. After Kanji and Sai leave the party, she insults him by calling him a short, geeky, monkey-faced man who is a pervert and a stalker. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Kanji is apparently proud that she's able to express herself like this. Then Sai calls Kanji a molester. <laughs> and he gets in trouble with the police. Sai's bitchy behavior is explained as her being a sickly, quiet child who wants to overcome the perceptions made by her peers. Ueda said in an interview that when it comes to Sai's attitude and actions, there are certain people out there who can say really nice things in front of you, then turn around and say something totally different to someone else. Looks can be deceiving, so I wanted to depict characters as being blindsided by Sai's true personality. Ueda san, I kind of find it hard to believe that this can justify all of Sai's malicious intentions. And she's still doing the same shit, it's just that we're seeing it through her perspective. When it comes to Sora, who is Kanji's dog, Sai is extremely hostile. It seemed the mere existence of Sora would drive her insane. She is single-handedly responsible for injuring one of Sora's paws and out of nowhere, she hates dogs. Number one, 
the love square. Sai has three main love interests in this manga. CCI model Takuma, gas station worker Shinji, and old acquaintance slash former crush Kanji. One interesting thing about reading slice of life manga is that they're time capsules and you can see how people were treated in certain periods. Let's start with Takuma. Sai meets him one day when she's walking around Momo and Kairi's college campus. Totally depressed by not having a boyfriend, she declares that Takuma is hers and she tries to seduce him by using her feminine wiles and contrived nice personality. Sai catches up with Honda, a fashion magazine photographer, and Takuma starts to get a little stir crazy. Literally, this man is blushing and dazed. It's hilarious. Takuma is your normal, average heartthrob who is a fan of Sai when she models for Men's Monthly. They both become a couple, and Sai uses Takuma as a way to distance herself from Kanji and flaunt her boyfriend to Momo and Kairi. Takuma also reveals that one of his coworkers. I confessed to him and she said that she loved him. He turns eyes off or down, which makes Sai think of herself as a potential girlfriend candidate. This reminds me of when Sai wanted to get together with Ryo. It made no sense since the reasoning for this was because they were the same. With Takuma, however, not only does he have very little personality, but there's also very little motivation for him to be with her. So Sai and Takuma start dating and and Sai starts to wonder why Takuma is being so nonchalant around her. He is not giving her loads of PDA, which makes Sai start to think that he's not even trying. Maybe he's the passive type. So she makes a small basket of food, like a picnic, and then boom, a dog shows up. Takuma loves dogs, so he was excited, but Sai wanted to fly the coop. Sai wants to win Takuma's love, any way possible. She really desperately wants to be with this man despite the fact that he is super indecisive of who he wants to be with. Takuma bounces back and forth between I and Sai, never once caring how his actions can affect other people. His thought process is just like, who wants him in that particular moment? And this is shown because I ended up confessing to Takuma again, saying that she really loves him. And then Takuma ends up giving in to I when she starts to kiss him, despite the fact that he's now in a romantic relationship with Sai. Can you tell what's gonna happen? Can you tell that I'm mad? Upon Sai hearing that Takuma blames her for the whole I situation, she breaks up with him and Kanji comforts Sai and tells her that he could never hate her because there are two sides to everyone. The moon analogy added a layer of depth to both Sai and Kanji's character because it offers a little bit of an explanation to why Sora actually still likes Sai, despite the fact that Sai hurt the dog. She hurt her. And then we have Shinji, who we're not going to talk about in detail. Because he sucks. One notable thing about him is that it didn't take too much for him to be pleased. Eating a bowl of ramen and hanging out with Sai seemed to be enough to please him, which leads Sai to thinking that Shinji is the one. Shinji is different than other boys. He listens to Sai. He understands her. He doesn't need a lavish lifestyle in order for him to be happy with her. You must think, wow, Shinji must be fantastic for Sai. Maybe Sai has finally found a potential boyfriend. Fun, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, like Takuma, Shinji uses Sai for his own personal gain. Shinji was in a car accident where Kanji was riding his bike on the road, and Shinji ends up hitting him. Shinji works at a gas station, so he doesn't have a lot of money to fix his car, which is around 200,000 to 300,000 yen. Sai helps pay for Shinji's damages with Kanji by modeling, and Kanji and Sai become closer in the process. Shinji and Sai share an intimate moment at the hotel where Sai reveals that her birthday is coming up and that she wants to celebrate it with him. But Shinji ends up bailing on her, leaving her a note on the dresser at the hotel, and Sai is just left completely perplexed. Shinji avoids Sai when she comes to his job, wanting to know a reason for why Shinji left Sai at the hotel. And Shinji's answer is that... 
Sai is not what he thought she was. You done lost your damn mind. When you get your damn mind, you call me. My confusion lies in the fact that Shinji knew Sai didn't make a lot of money from her modeling job when Kanji told this loser off saying that she worked really hard to pay for the car damages. So him being wary of Sai and wanting to distance himself from her just doesn't really work. Like Momo said, Sai only falls for people based on their looks. And speaking of bad messaging, at one point, Shinji tells Sai that she is super cute in her high school uniform and that it's dangerous to look at her. Then Sai says this uniform holds power. That sincerely makes me want to gag. Um, is her talent being naturally pretty? Is that supposed to be a romantic gesture? And if someone called me cute, in a high school uniform, I would be running away immediately. And if you can see where this is going, Shinji ends up using Sai to pay for his car damages. I'm sorry, girl, men can be trash. Number two, drama over substance. Sai's development is tied to the fact that she enjoys stealing other girls' boyfriends. But when it's just her wanting to be in the relationship, she gets bored. There is a flashback nearing the end of the third chapter where we find out why Sai wants to torment Momo. Because she is too perfect. But there are some girls who think Momo is hard to talk to because of her tan skin. This not only proves Ueda's initial intentions for Sai of being a character who displays incorrect social behavior, but also showcases how colorism affected how Momo was perceived. Staying in high school makes it clear to the reader that Momo is different from everyone else because you're in an environment and community that is predominantly light skin. Although Sai is given more agency in this story and is not just limited to the stereotypical mean girl, she doesn't really grow all that much. She is quite manipulative, ruthless, and doesn't value anyone unless they can give her something in return. And Kanji was the best love interest that Sai ever had. Peach Girl Next is a direct continuation of the original manga and anime series. It is now 10 years in the future and Momo and Kairi are still an item. Momo wants to take things to the next level and get married to Kairi. She is constantly wondering why Kairi hasn't proposed to her. However, we find out a little bit later that Kairi has been saving money from his job as being a soba chef to support their dream of having a family of five children. Once Momo and Kairi establish their new relationship, surprise, surprise, Sai Kashiwagi is back in full force wanting to test their relationship because she has nothing else to do apparently. So Sai's boredom leads Momo and Kairi down a rabbit hole to see how much they truly love one another. All the while, Toji returns as Sai's neighbor, causing the love triangle cycle all over again. So as you can probably tell, the premise of Peach Girl Next is nearly identical to the previous manga and anime. I've spent a lot of time reading reviews in preparation for this video, and there is beginning to be a pattern of people not being happy about the love triangle when these people are adults. And I agree. One reviewer states, they too old for high school shenanigans. They are 27 years old and Momo still can't get rid of Sai yet. 10 years with Kairi and they can't communicate properly. 10 years later and she and Toji and Sai still can't function normally around each other. Either Momo and Kairi need to move away from Japan or to Okinawa or Momo needs to beat Sai's ass once and for all. Or I don't know, do the adult thing and get a restraining order? Sai needs a life. And another reviewer states, <laughs> I loved the series when I was younger and first getting into the manga. 
but goodness. Coming back to this story again just didn't sit right with me entirely. Sai is still causing trouble as an adult and it just seems petty, dramatic, and pointless at this stage. It's a shame that the characters are back and under these circumstances again. There are some moments of growth, but it feels like an uphill battle again for the main characters. And the real kicker, especially with Sai, is that all the characters have significantly regressed. As I said before, Sai being a sickly and quiet child propelled this loud and commanding persona when she's a teenager. She is tired of people looking down on her and wants to be her own person. But in this story, she is nearly the same if not worse than the original manga and anime. Stacy from Dance Moms said it best. At least I'm only one bitch. You're like three bitches, all your different personalities. I gotta call you like bitch one, two, three. Sai has like three different personalities in this story. And I can't prove it yet, but I am sure that Sai's manipulation has probably siphoned off five years of my life. First of all, Sai starts to question Momo and Kairi's relationship when they haven't been married and been dating for 10 years. I don't know about you, but like marriage doesn't always have to be the end point. People just like the comfort of being with each other. They don't have to be locked in matrimony to be in a relationship, but... I digress. And Sai's main objective, and even the manga's description, is that Momo and Kairi's relationship is too peaceful, and Sai wants to test their romance. Why? Now let's get into the characters. Momo Adachi. There isn't much to say, to be honest. <laughs> she is pretty much sidelined in all of the major conflicts. Her happy-go-lucky attitude seems to manifest itself to avoid looking at the reality of her situation, which is being in a love triangle for over a decade. It was really nice to see Momo swimming again. She is a diving instructor, and we see her go scuba diving in the ocean and how happy being in the water makes her. Momo is warier of Sai now that she's her new neighbor. However, Momo is still very naive towards Sai's actions. One example is that Momo doesn't distance herself when Sai conspired with a doctor to skew her pregnancy results and basically tell Momo that she can't give birth to children therefore causing drama with Kairi since he wanted to have a large family. Momo spends so much time with Toji, helping him prepare for his diving test, and doesn't see that she is worried about him more than she should be. Toji even tells her that she shouldn't spend so much time with him, as she has a fiancé. And Momo's just like, no! I've got this. I'm just worried about your mental health. I don't want you to be tricked by Sai again. But again, Momo. Toji is an adult and has to be able to handle these situations by himself. Oh, but she also gets territorial when Toji is around Sai and also is completely upset with Kairi for hanging around with Misao, even though that she's doing the same thing with Toji. Hypocrite much? Toji finally gets a storyline. His wife passed away in a car accident and it's taken a significant toll on his mental health. He lost a lot of weight and keeps quiet and to himself for the first couple of chapters. We also learn that he doesn't have a really good relationship with his parents due to his wife dying and having to take care of his child. Miyu. Sadly, Toji is victim to Ueda's writing when it comes to sidelining male characters, so we don't get to see a lot of him throughout the story in terms of his emotional growth. Sai is completely ruined in this series. Peach Girl fans, you're gonna be extremely frustrated with her actions. Sai constantly compares herself to Misao, who grabbed the attention of both her love interest, Ryo, and Toji. And honestly, it's just so weird to me to make a character like Sai Kashiwagi sympathetic. A common comment that I got on my first Peach Girl video is that some people didn't like how Ueda condoned Sai's actions by using the bully turned friend trope. I'm sorry, call me crazy, but it just doesn't make sense for Momo and Sai to be friends. 
Here's a list of reasons why. Sai bought Momo's tote bag after calling it ugly in the mall during the first episode. Sai tricks Toji into waiting with Sai instead of meeting with Momo outside the pool. Sai then tricks Toji into practicing his first kiss on her. She also blackmails Toji into breaking up with Momo during the amusement park, and also tries to confuse Momo about the man she truly loved in episode 24, which leads to her impulsively changing her mind with being with Toji and running off in the whole craziness of the thunderstorm to go be with Kairi. And overall, being a very selfish person who doesn't consider how her actions can affect other people. But oh no, Sai is a good person in the end. She's her friend. Oh my gosh. She's such a sweet soul. Creating Sai as a good person doesn't work. She is at her best when she is vicious, vile and nasty towards other people. So I'm editing the video right now and maybe saying Sai is completely unredeemable is a bit too far. And I think I take that back. Do I hate her? Yes. Do I think she has a good character? No. Should she be humanized? Yes. Should she be condoned? No. So my main point here is I don't think that Sai should be condoned for all the bad things, but I don't see a problem with her being humanized, if that makes sense. One silver lining we see with Sai is she becomes a maternal figure to Toji's daughter Miyu, and this softer, tranquil side of her comes out. She is worried that Toji will leave her and she will end up all alone. The next character we have is Misao. She comes back into the story after she quit her job at the school nurse, and we see her now taking care of her family, specifically her grandmother. She's been having some romantic struggles due to caretaking after her grandparents. And it was nice to see someone in their mid-30s have a midlife crisis. However, I'm not gonna lie, she isn't very likable. She is very self-conscious about her appearance, specifically her weight. She refers to herself as chubby and not worthy of having a man based on her figure. There's a plot point where she ends up forcing herself onto Toji because she is desperate in getting laid. Oh Lord. This is S.A. Misao targeted Toji because he's been through similar things that she has went through. In the context of Misao as a character, this shift is a little weird. In the anime, Misao is a school nurse and provides support when the main characters had an issue. Like when Toji cried to Misao about Sai manipulating him and Momo's relationship. Or when Kairi wants to get Momo back after making a dumb choice, leaving her to go with Misao to help his brother Ryo. Also, Ryo was in love with her regardless of her figure. Are we forgetting that? <laughs> there is no foreshadowing of Misao feeling this way, not even in the original manga. Also, another weird thing that Misao would do is she would say that Toji got cute and still refers to him as a kid. Please stop. It's making my skin crawl me so. <laughs> Though I do understand her body dysmorphia since her parents were often very rude to her, calling her a disgrace because her weight equates to her health, which it doesn't. It seems to really impact Misao as we often see her crying, feeling very emotional, and needs supports from other people, specifically of men. And then finally, we have Kairi, who enraged me the most. I'm sorry, I'm not a Kairi stan, y'all. I'm sorry. He starts out as a very supportive and kind boyfriend. When one of his coworkers started making romantic advances to him, he backs away and doesn't seem interested. Even though Sai tries to put a buffer into it by taking a picture of Kairi sleeping with his coworker, which kind of reminds me about Momo and Jigoro and... Ugh! Oh, Lord of mercy. But Kairi starts to take an interest in Misao, and not just as an old friend. And this is something that always bothered me about Kairi's character. I'm not gonna get too ahead of myself, but his interactions with Misao and how his facial expressions change when she comes near him. Weird. There, I said it. 
weird. Sai does try and manipulate the situation and tries to stir Kyrie's old feelings for Misao. Sai starts sending texts out to Kyrie about Misao and how she is heading to the hotel to get laid with Toji. But newsflash, Toji has no idea that Misao is going to the hotel. So she's gonna walk all the way to this hotel and just be left there alone. After Kyrie starts ignoring Sai's text, Sai calls him and says that she is giving him a once in a lifetime opportunity to turn Misao virginless. No, thank you. No, thank you. And then, of course, Kyrie starts spouting off stuff saying, You're rude. You're crazy. You're a bitch. Yada, yada, yada. Then we get multiple scenes of Kyrie thinking and pondering about Misa being alone. And you guessed it, Kyrie runs away from Momo. Not only does he hug Misa once he meets up with her, but he goes into the hotel room with Misa, not even calling Momo about it. Did you learn nothing when you left with Misa to go check on your brother and not call Momo about it? And even if Momo wasn't watching, which peeps spoiler alert, Sai ends up doing a face call with Momo and Momo's not everything, it still isn't right for Kairi to go with Mizo in a hotel room. Momo decides not to panic and wholeheartedly agree that Kairi had a logical reason for going in the hotel room with Mizo. Kairi continues to bounce back between Momo and Mizo, not even trying to communicate properly to Momo about his stuff with Mizo. For example, Momo mentions to Kairi that she needs to bring Mizo back to their home while she is hysterical but Kairi refuses, thereby demonstrating that he wants alone time with her, even if it's not romantically motivated. However, this is where things start getting like... There is a confrontation scene between Momo, Toji, and Kairi, with Misao being the center of the problem. Misao had an argument with her parents, which forced her into emotional hysteria, running all the way to Kairi's soba shop, needing someone to vent her frustrations about. Momo rushes over to Kairi's soba shop to figure out what's going on with Misao. Kairi continuously resists any of Momo or Toji's words in order to justify him taking care of Misao alone. One thing I found weird is that Misao was fine to talk to anyone. This leads me to believe that Kairi really did want to be alone with Misao and didn't really consider how her feelings were about talking with other people about her situation. And this is where things begin to be very concerning. Misao is 35 years old. Who cares? Why do you let your parents control your every move? Come on. And while Misao and Toji are talking, Momo and Kairi are arguing, and Momo can't even have a conversation about this with Kairi because she continually interrupts him and doesn't let him speak. To be fair, I definitely do understand where Momo is coming from because if I was to see my partner interacting with an old friend for no reason and be secretive about it, I would be very mad at them. So upon not being able to reconcile their differences, Momo decides to call off their marriage. Momo then runs away and Toji follows her trying to calm her down. But by the end of all of this, Misao ends up staying with Sai. We all know how this is gonna go. Sai barks orders at Misao and Misao obeys her every command. Misao's dad walks up to Sai's doorstep, demanding that Misao return to her duties of caring for her grandma and mother. Misao decides to return home to not be a burden to anyone. Then Kairi decides that he's going to be going with Misao to take care of her parents as well. Kairi! I was rooting for you! We were all rooting for you! How dare you! And then, if things couldn't get any worse, Kairi says, I'm sorry, Momo. You're really important to me, but I can't abandon Misao. And this is Kairi's main flaw as a character. And I'm gonna say this loud. 
You can't build a healthy relationship with someone when most of the relationship is a lie and isn't going to reflect how you truly feel about that person. Remember when Momo asked what Kairi liked about her and his response was, I like your sincerity? It pops up again in the anime to where Momo comes to the conclusion that Kairi only wanted to be with her because she reminded him of Misao. You don't have to read into that if you don't want to. So Kairi leaves with Misao, which leads Momo and Toji becoming closer. Kairi becomes the golden child and helps take care of Misao's parents, and Misao suddenly reveals that she likes him. And in classic Peach Girl fashion, Momo heard the entire conversation. Momo is so brokenhearted that Kairi seemed so happy when Misao responded to his feelings, especially after the long history they had. So Momo then runs over to Toji's house to drop off things for his daughter. And then Toji responds, are you okay? And Momo's like, oh, totally, fine. And then of course, there's a moment of pause. Momo, are you okay? Toji says. Momo's like, no. I'm not. I overheard Kyrie and Misao's conversation where Misao said that she loved Kyrie. And then Toji starts to kiss her. Toji continuously tells Momo, you're not hurting me. I want to start a family with you. And right before they could do the little devil's tango, Sai walks in. <laughs> If the top of my head could unscrew like a bottle cap, I would remove this from my brain and I would grab a sponge and scrub this from my memory. Y'all, it was so bad. And I don't know why I was surprised that Peach Girl would rush through romances if that's not literally their brand. After a couple of weeks have passed, Momo and Kairi meet up to discuss the future of their relationship. And Momo decides to break up with Kairi, uttering the words, goodbye. Momo is not second place in a relationship anymore. And she goes over to Toji's house to tell Toji that she needs a little bit of time to think about his proposal. Because surprise, Toji ended up proposing to Momo. Sai overhears this and proceeds to choke Momo, saying that you need to go away. And Toji tells Sai off, and it was the best feeling ever. Sai deserved this moment. She was borderline bullying, and her intentions were bad, considering that she wants Momo to die. Which affects Miyu because she was standing there watching them the entire time. Her brain is completely in turmoil, and you can just tell the guilt was eating Sai alive. She wanted the ground to suck her in. The last arc is Momo and Toji trying to find Sai as she ran away from causing a ton of trauma to Miyu as she views herself as a toxic person. Sai feels that she has contributed to Miyu acting differently and doesn't want to be a burden on Momo or Toji. Once Momo finds Sai at the beach, they both go diving in the ocean and they they share some touching moments. They save a boat from drowning and Momo and Sai talk to one another with Sai literally saying, I can't believe I'm going to be stuck in the ocean with the person that I hated most. Again, it is impossible for Momo and Sai to be friends. Momo nearly dies as Sai is trying to reach for help and Kairi suddenly finds out that Momo has been stuck stranded in the ocean. So he frantically goes calling any person that she knows in order for him to rescue her. And he ends up getting back together with Momo. Sorry, what? I was very disappointed. I was very disappointed. Toji even says that he would have prioritized Miyu's safety over Momo's. Which, given the mindset in the last several chapters leading up to Sai disappearing, is not the case at all. Toji wanted to start a family with Momo because even though Momo will never fully replace his wife, Toji still thinks of Momo in high regard enough to be with her. Kairi tries to justify his actions 
questions by saying that Momo didn't fully listen to the conversation when Kyrie responded to Misao saying that he could never hurt Momo like that because he truly loves her. I'm not sure I'm buying that. When he stayed with Misao to help her family, no normal person would just leave their almost wife to stay with another woman's family. I just think it's a pain in the keister, to be honest. The manga ends with Momo and Kairi in a happy marriage as Kairi puts an engagement ring on Momo's hand. The last words of the chapter are, everything is precious and beloved. The shape of a love that never ends. So that is this video done. Final thought. Peach Girl was a very crazy, messy, and problematic story that I still find very entertaining. This is the end of my video. I hope you all enjoyed this. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up, leave a comment on your thoughts. I would love to know what you guys think, and I will see you guys soon for my next video. Until next time, bye. You could end up with something very special. I think I was wrong. Maybe I do want to be a dad.